you're on camera. Okay. Today is March 25th, 2016. My name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Sue Verhoff, the senior archivist here at the History Center. Also with us is Mr. Carl Stone, the father of Brian Stone, the young man we're interviewing today. We're here to record his oral history. Uh, he served in the U.S. Air Force during Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, and also served in Afghanistan. Mr. Stone's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We're honored to have you with us today, Mr. Stone, and, and thank you for participating in the progress, uh, in, the, in the project. Can you uh, tell us where you live, please? I live in Athens, Georgia currently. Okay. And could you tell us a little bit about your early years? Sure. My, uh, my father was an active duty Air Army officer. So from before I was born until the summer after I graduated high school, he was on active duty. So he moved about every three years. I was actually born at the Fort Stewart Army Hospital um, in southeastern Georgia near Savannah. And we moved around to Virginia, Texas, Alaska when I was eight, which was pretty exciting. And then um, Kansas, Fort Leavenworth, and then back to Georgia again um, by the time I got out of high school. So okay. it was an interesting life. What year did you graduate from high school? I graduated 1987 from North Clayton High School in Clayton County on okay. the south side of Atlanta. And what did you do after high school? I was accepted to the Virginia Military Institute, okay. so I went to, a, which is a prestigious in our mind, four-year military college in Western Virginia. So I attended VMI for four years as a cadet, and I was also an Air Force ROTC while I was there. And upon graduation in 1991, in May, I was commissioned in the Air Force as a second lieutenant. How did you like uh, your experience at VMI? <laughs> we say it's a great place to be from. Um, it's a, uh, that's our little saying amongst ourselves. Um, it's, it was a great experience. It was, it was kind of a real testing environment. You know, I, when I was growing up, I wasn't a football player. I didn't test myself in different endeavors, and that was my opportunity in my mind to, as an 18-year-old, to test myself. And if you know what the military school environment's like, I try to equate it to people that have been on active duty. Um, it's like going to boot camp while you're taking 20 college credit hours. And instead of having that drill instructor who's highly experienced with years of experience, it's that 19-year-old sophomore who's your direct first-line trainer. Right. Um, and they're so angry about the year before when they were a freshman, so they take that out on you as a freshman class. So that was the experience. But it was a great, this, uh, my 25th reunion is this fall, so we're looking forward to going back. And okay. um, very close with my class, very small class of 250 that graduated my year. So you, w w you were commissioned as in the Air Force upon graduation? Yes. What was the world situation like at that time? It was interesting. If you look at history, 1990-91 was my senior year of college. So Desert Shield, Desert Storm encapsulated my senior year because, you know, as we know, Iraq invaded Kuwait in August right before I went back to school that year to start my senior year. Um, and then, of course, we very closely watched what was occurring in the mm -hmm. early part of 1991. Uh, I remember the night the war kicked off, there was only two television sets to the entire Corps of Cadets in our, in our student center. And we went down there to watch the evening news that night, and that was when the air war kicked off in January. Um, and when I got down there, there were about 20 of us. And by the time it was time to taps and time to head back to bed, there were probably half the Corps squeezed into this room <laughs> trying to watch the news because not only for our future, because most of us were going to go into the military, the classmates that had come ahead of us, the classes, we knew a lot of these guys, mm -hmm. they were off fighting in the war. As a matter of fact, a, a member of the class of 88, who were the seniors when I started, was killed, um, Terry Plunk. He was um, an EOD officer in the Army. He was clearing bombs outside of the Kuwait City Airport after the actual war had ended, and a bomb went off and, and killed him. So um, that was pretty heartrending, I guess, and that yeah. they announced that in barracks that he had died. and. We had known him. He, he was on the honor court. He'd been a, a cadet officer. He was pretty well known among our class. So after, once you were commissioned, where were you assigned? Or um, what training did you get? Right. To? We had to wait for a while. That's the other part of the story. As you know, the drawdown that was going on at that time frame in, right. in the DOD started before Desert Shield was put on hold. And then after March of 91, when the war ended, they started to draw down massively. And we had come in in 87 in the middle of the Cold War. So there were thousands and thousands of cadets and all the services, and they had nowhere to put us. So I had to wait 10 months to go on active duty. Um, and at that time, there were no provisions for employment, health insurance, nothing. You were on your own. You were an inactive commissioned lieutenant. Um, and some people waited as long as 14 months um, to go on active duty. So I waited 10 months until March of 92. 
Uh, my initial training was actually at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, I was an information management officer when I came into the service, which is an, an administrative officer. And I went there for about three weeks, and then my first assignment was up at Elmendorf Air Force Base in Anchorage, Alaska, returning to where I lived when I was a child. Okay. So where did you go from Elmendorf? Elmendorf, um, I was there for about three years. Most of that time was spent as a protocol officer, and I was just going to share a quick picture there. We, we had the honor of being the gas station, if you would, for any of the airplanes going from Washington, D.C., heading over to um, Asia would stop there for refueling. So we had a lot of congressional delegations that came through there. Um, and this was probably one of my favorite airplane flights that came through there. Um, these pictures, the gentleman on the right is Sam Nunn, former senator from Georgia. The person in the parka there is me. And on the other side of the page is Senator John Glenn, the astronaut. Uh, they were on the same plane together going over to Asia um, for a trip. So I, that's me opening the door for them leaving our lounge, heading back out to their airplane. So I met a lot of folks. Um, President Clinton came through there in 1994. Um, Secretaries of State and Defense, the Prime Minister of Canada. So um, that was an exciting experience to get to um, to work up there and get to know them over that time frame as a young officer. So, is that was that the place where where the uh, I guess the as you said the the refueling point for mm -hmm. folks headed right. In any, I mean, Air Force One could make the flight without refueling, but all the smaller planes out of um, Andrews Air Force Base, 89th Air Wing, anybody going to Asia, we were just the perfect stopping point. It's the great circle theory. You think Alaska is so far north, but you're actually flying a, a circle to right. get to Asia, and you fly right over Anchorage. So, and typically it'd work out to be about two in the morning when they get there. They never, they never came in the middle of the afternoon. So right. we would be out there with our generals and their wives um, and our protocol staff, and the plane would land, and they'd be there for about an hour, hour and a half to refuel and service the aircraft. Uh, and my job was, I, was, I had to go out and check on the airplane to make, see when it was ready. And I, of course, was wearing my blues. I didn't have, I had a park on, but had some long johns and blue plant. And you imagine Alaska in January at 2 a.m., it, you know, in Anchorage, it could be, you know, minus 15, minus 20 outside. So I had to go out to the airplane. Of course, our maintenance guys had the, the car hearts, the big, they were nice and warm and toasty out there. I'm freezing, haven't asked the plane ready. Like, oh, come back in 10 minutes, check with us, sir. Okay, go back inside, try to get warmed up, go back, check on the plane again. So, um, yeah, so we had a lot of folks who come through there in the middle. It's just very, very surreal to be sitting in this lounge at two in the morning with these, you know, famous people um, hosting them on their visit. Were, were, was it primarily uh, government? VIPs or were there, I mean, who were some of the people? I mean, you mentioned John Glenn and Senator Nunn. Yeah, we had a lot of congressional delegations that came through there. Um, Secretary of State Warren Christopher came through at one point. I uh, mentioned the president. The president came with to give a speech actually on Veterans Day 1994. He was actually visiting the base. Um, we had the Prime Minister of Canada, um, four star generals. Um, you know, mostly it was military or congressional groups. Anybody that the Air Force was transporting on our, our military aircraft. So not so much celebrities never came through there, um, unfortunately. Did, did, were you exposed to people coming back? Coming back from Asia? Yeah, they would stop yeah. there also on the way back to refuel. So they, I mean, you really didn't have too much. You were kind of the, the you had to kind of make things smooth for Right, hold. Uh, we we had this. We had a very large. We called distinguished visitor VIP lounge. Uh, we would have food out. We would have either fruit or donuts and drinks and coffee. And they would just sit and have these sofas and televisions. They would just sit in there and relax. And you know, if there was a general, then our general would be there. If there was a spouse, our general's wife would be there. Um, and and they would just kind of host them. We would just be there to assist them with whatever they might need. A lot of times, there'd be lots of people with them in addition to the VIPs. How frequently were you called upon to do this? I mean, is this week? Weekly? Yeah, or? it was probably, I would say weekly, especially in the summertime. We'd get a lot more traveling through there, it seemed like. In the, in the wintertime, they'd be more, more infrequent just because, you know, they want to go over and visit Asia when the weather's nice, just like anywhere else in the world. Uh, but there were times it would be one or two days a week, and you'd just, you'd just you know, sleep in the next morning to make up for your, your lost time in the middle of the night. It just got to be the way. It was very interesting, though. I really enjoyed that experience. So you did that for three years? I did that for about two and a half years. And then I, my next assignment, when I left Alaska, I went to Langley Air Force Base okay. in the Tidewater, Virginia area. And I remained in the protocol, which is kind of strange. Most people do protocol for one tour and they're done with it. I stayed in protocol. I went to Air Combat Command, which is the major command for the Air Force. For at that time, all of the um, 
basically tactical aircraft, the bombers, the fighters in the continental United States. So it's headquartered at Air Combat Command. And I worked on the staff for the four-star general there. Um, we had a staff, staff of about 20 people that worked in our protocol office that supported all of the general and all the VIPs that came to visit our base, which was a lot. What, what, if someone was coming, so what year is this now? Where are we in the okay. timeline? So Alaska was 1992 to 1995. I moved to Langley in 1995 in February, and I okay. was there until 1997. So okay. we're in the mid-90s. Um, we hosted, um, my favorite visit probably was the Israeli Air Force Chief of Staff came for about three days, which is a long time for a VIP yeah. visit. Most of them are about a day. Um, so we had to figure out things to do for three days to entertain him and, and his handful of officers with him. So we went to Colonial Williamsburg. You know, We went up there, which was just up the road from, mm -hmm. from Langley Air Force Base. And um, probably a funny story that happened there is we were at a, it was Sunday night, and they'd stayed over later, and we had to do dinner. We had no dinner plans. The O Club was closed. Officers Club was closed. And so I took him to, like, Applebee's or someplace like that, and I thought, okay, this will be okay. You know, this will go fine. Well, we get there. We get seated. The waiter comes over. Instead of being, you know, a nice, formal waiter, he grabs a chair and sits down. How you doing, fellas? And I'm thinking, this is not the dinner party to be Mr. Casual American waiter. Please stand up and just act like you are a normal waiter. So that was a little odd. I was like... They probably didn't expect that, so he didn't. They didn't. We were all in civilian clothes. They didn't know who we were. Obviously, well, what was the reaction of the? the they user? were. They didn't. They never said anything. Never really responded to it. I, 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 maybe they assumed all American waiters sit down at the table with them and <laughs> have a beer. <laughs> so, but that was that was a good experience working there as well. And I really, uh, and I, I, I then. Before I left there, I became a wing executive officer. I worked for the first fighter wing commander, which is also on Langley Air Force Base. Um, the commander had been in Alaska when I was up there as a colonel and he was now the wing commander mm -hmm. and knew me. So he hired me as a, I was, I'd been a captain for about one year. And typically in the Air Force, a wing executive officer, is not the same as an army executive officer, which is a deputy commander, and the Air Force is more of an adjutant. Okay. So, but typically for the wing level, that's a major or a senior captain. Um, and I'd been a captain for one year when he hired me because he knew me and he knew I'd, mm -hmm. I, I guess, you know, I'd do a good job for him. So I was in that job for about nine months. And that was, that was a lot of learning, big learning curve. Um, working directly for him, doing promotion boards. A lot of it was officer promotion boards right. and all the th crossing the T's, dotting the I's in the promotion system is a complicated did, process. Did you have the opportunity to fly at all? Not at this point in time. That's the, my next assignment actually. Um, while I was there, I mentioned I was an administrative officer. That career field was merged with our communications career field um, in the mid 90s. And they said, we can't take all of you into communications because there's just too many information management officers. Here's a list of career fields, pick something. And, and a career field called Air Battle Manager was number two on the list in need of, of people. And I said, what is that? And they said, well, that's a command and control, it's a flying position, a command and control officer. And I have, I have poor eyesight, my eyesight, I wear contacts, so my eyesight wasn't good enough to be a pilot in the Air Force. And, but for that, as long as your vision corrects to 2020, you can pass the, the flight physical. And so I cross-trained at that point into Air Battle Manager. And so when I left Langley in 1997, I went down to Tyndall Air Force Base in Panama City, Florida. Um, to um, do the air battle manager initial qualification course, which was a nine month, which is kind of a long course, uh, nine month initial training course to become an air battle manager. Um, and I completed that course in April of 1998. So your, your background in information systems was probably something that helped you there, wasn't it? Um, is that a computer? Oriented um, it, it, it's to a gr degree it is. At that point in time, they just reopened up the Air Battle Manager Schoolhouse. It had been closed for a couple of years. And so they were taking in, they wanted as many bodies as they could get. Um, and they had a lot of more, quote, senior. I was by then, as I mentioned, a captain at that point. So okay. in my class of 12, when I was at Tyndall, four of us were captains. And the other ones were lieutenants. They were new to the Air Force. So we had come from other career fields. <clears throat> so they wanted that well, Tell experience. us a little bit about what uh, air battle management is. Sure. Air battle management, which it sounds like it sounds like more of a textbook kind of job, you know, but it, it, I, I tend to call it a command and control officer is what most people would understand it as. So air battle managers man a couple of major systems in the Air Force. So we're the mission crew officers on the E-3 AWACS and the E-8J STARS aircraft. Um, we're also the uh, mission officers for the mobile TACs, which are ground-based um, radar systems that provide command and control and weapons control of our aircraft. And we also are responsible for manning fixed sites like the NORAD facilities in the United States, the eastern and the western sector, um, and I, I'm getting in Korea as well. There's a, a fixed site there as well. So we 
man at the entry level you're talking to the fighter aircraft telling them what's going on at the higher levels you're the leading edge of the air commander so that general back at the air operations center he needs something to change in the battle plan of the day the AWACS or the J-STARS aircraft are the ones out there talking directly to those fighter aircraft monitoring the entire battlefield that's where the air battle manager right. title comes from is we're controlling that fight if you would um, out there on the leading edge and as you're describing that, what I'm visualizing in my head is scenes we see frequently on TV and in the movies, movies where there are screens and there mm -hmm. are people observing where friendlies and, and uh, bad guys are. And that's, that's essentially yeah, what that's I understand yeah, each, each system is a little different, but the, the core of it is you've got a, a control system. You have some type of radar sensor that's detecting, and you've got a, a you've got a console in front of you with that screen. You've got raw radar, which are the dots on there that you see, and then you've got symbology that you or your crew place on there to track what those aircraft are, um, and you're ma you're monitoring that, and you're then telling our friendly guys what's going on in that battle. With we have multiple radio systems, you've got data link systems now, you've got satellite communication to talk to various agencies and aircraft. That's quite a change from protocol. It was. It was a. It was a. It was a very interesting um, to shift gears at a. This was about five and a half years into my career when I got qualified and then went to my my first operational assignment, which was Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City, uh, the 552nd Air Control Wing, which is the base for AWACS, the E3 AWACS aircraft okay. um, for the U.S. When when you were at Tinker, you know, you uh, what what was a typical day like for you, or how frequently would you be airborne? It's not as often as you would think. Um, when you first got qual when you first got there, you went through um, ground training, simulator training, and then you go to we had a, a squadron that was the, the training squadron. Um, because as opposed to airplanes like F-15, F-16, that have a base that train you. Because things like AWACS and J-STARS, you only have they're only in one place. So the the training on the actual aircraft takes place once you get to the base. So I spent another nine months when I got to Tinker in the training pipeline, going through the ground training, then the flying training. You get your check flight complete, and then I had to go through the Air Force Survival School because all aviators have to go through survival school, which is up at Fairchild Air, For Fairchild Air Force Base in Washington State. And I did that in late 1998. Tell us a little bit about that experience. <laughs> survival school is definitely interesting. It's three weeks of training. Um, the first two and a half weeks are um, training for being on the ground, out so, you know, whether you're in the woods or you know, primarily it's a wooded, wooded environment up there. Um, so they do about a week and a half of classroom training to train you on different techniques for surviving in the wild. Then you spend about a week and six days out in the woods. Um, the first couple of days you have an instructor with you and we're in small groups. They break up, there's about 60 people in the entire um, going through the training at one time. Each group is about five. So a group of five plus one instructor. Um, and so the first couple of days you're learning basic wildlife skills, how to build a shelter, how to make a fire, how to make snares to catch animals, um, you know, land navigation, how to, remember Air Force people, so we're not like the Army where that's, everybody does land navigation. We don't do that until we get to a place like survival school. Um, and then they start training you on your evasion techniques. And you have to evade, and they have the instructors who are out pretending to be enemy tracking you through the woods. And you have to evade them and move from point A to point B. They give you a map, you have a certain amount of time, and at first your instructor's with you, and then the last couple of days the instructor leaves and it's just you. And it's your job to figure out each morning you get up, you have to get from A to B, and you have about, you know, eight hours to do that. And the last day, everybody's pretty tired by the last day, you've been in the woods, and you're going from point A to point B, and most people are tired, they just make a beeline. Well, of course, the instructors have a line across there and catch all of them. My group, we were a group of three, they split us even smaller by then. We did a, a triangle, we went all the way out here and then came back in this way, and they never caught us, which was nice. Um, so we made it to the last day, but then the last, after that, they have the POW camp experience. So whether you evade them or not, after you get the last time you come in, they throw you in a POW camp for about a day without any training, which is a very interesting technique. They want you to, to do all the things wrong. And then they take you back to the classroom for a few days and train you in techniques and how to handle being a POW, how to resist to the best of your ability. That's interesting. Um, and then they put you back in the POW camp for about another two days. Um, and I was actually the senior ranking officer um, in this experience. I was the second ranking officer in the class, but the senior guy had to go home for a medical emergency. And so by the time we were in the POW camp, I was the SRO. Uh, and of okay. course, in the Vietnam era, we know how important that role is. Right. And this was in a training environment, but they wanted us to do certain things. And so people would come to me and ask me questions, do we do this or not? I had no idea. 
but just like it, you had to, you had to give an answer. I said, do it or don't do it. And once I said that, the word would spread among these multiple barracks we were in, and and that they wanted to see can we have that chain of command, just like the Vietnam experience. You know, they were still they they learned so much from Korea and Vietnam. Now they train us in those techniques to make sure if that ever happens that we do things the right way. Now the return with honor, of course, is that's the motto of the Air Force Survival School folks: is return but maintain your honor while you're right. there. So uh, it was definitely a it was an emotional experience. The very last day we were there, we'd been there about two days, and they'd form us up, and they had a pretend country that was our enemy that had us, and they would disparage America, and they gave these speeches, and the commander of the of the enemy camp, we got up there, and he started talking about how horrible we were, and we how, you know, if we didn't represent our country, and then he said, gave some examples of great American POWs that, in time, and then he gave us an intention and about face, which he never used American commands. And so we turned around, and they had had this fake flag of this pretend country behind us. And while he was giving us a speech, they lowered that flag, and they'd raised the U.S. flag. And then they did the, they did the national anthem. And it was like, you know, you teary-eyed at the right. time. Yeah. And I thought what that must have been like for these guys from Vietnam that had come spent home. seven, eight years in the POW camp to be able to come home and see their flag. And this was just a training environment, but it, that was how intense it was. Uh, Were you married at the time? I was not at that time. Okay. I didn't get married until several years after that. Okay. So after you completed that, when were you assigned to a squadron? Yes, I was assigned to the uh, the 965th AACS Airborne Air Control Squadron, which is part of the, the we had at that time three squadrons, and they added a fourth while I was there, a fourth operational squadron of AWACS, um, and that was in early 1999 that I was fully qualified, and I began flying um, first stateside missions, and then I eventually deployed that spring for the first time to the Middle East. What was the typical week like for you? I mean. Yeah, the, it was an interesting environment in, the, in, the, in these big squadrons. We had about 300 people on our squadron. It's a mixture of officer and enlisted aviators because we had about half our crew were enlisted aviators, technicians and um, our controllers that detected enemy aircraft. Those were enlisted positions that worked for us on the aircraft. So at a big squadron, um, so you have your flying job, whatever your position is on the airplane, but everybody has a ground job too because there's nobody else in the squadron. You know, that's where the Air Force operates. We don't have people there to do our scheduling and our training and your admin stuff. You do all those jobs as well. So you kind of have two jobs. So you, even when you're not flying, you have a job on the ground. Uh, my job primarily, I was an assistant flight commander and then later on a flight commander over a portion of the personnel in the, in the squadron. Um, you didn't fly, as I mentioned earlier, you didn't fly as much as you think you would. Uh, you had to fly as a brand new um, first year, you were inexperienced, they can see you had to fly at least twice a month. Okay. That was the minimum. Um, and you typically would fly, if you were home stationed, you might fly four times um, in the course of a month. And each flight was a two day experience. The first day was your, you, you basically did your mission planning for a, almost a full day to prepare for the next day's mission. So every flying day was a two day experience. Um, so when you're home stationed, maybe four times a month. When you go overseas, you fly a lot more. Well, did you, when, when you were flying, uh, did you when you if you did your planning and mm -hmm. took off where you did you just fly to a station and and just maintain position out there and, we would did, it was kind of interesting because we would go wherever we have we, we'd work with fighter units all around the country so we go wherever we have something set up for the day so we a, a typical mission maybe you may launch out of out of oklahoma city at 6 a.m um, local time and then you may fly all the way to the east coast to virginia and work with some fighter aircraft off the coast of Virginia in the morning. Then you may transit from there down to Florida because that's where the missions were at and work with some other fighters down off the coast of Florida in the early afternoon and then head home. So typically we may have one or two or even three different working areas you'd have set up and this was all planned out by folks back at the squadron to make sure we had effective live training. Um, we control the fighters against each other so we'd have a red and a blue controller if you would on the airplane fighting against each other working with the different, um, uh, different fighter aircraft. So what, where are we now in, in the timeline or in, of okay. the conflict and just timeline in general? Yeah, so this is early 1999. So okay. actually this is just as um, Bosnia was going on okay. um, and, and the war in the Balkans, the air war that was going on was occurring just as I was getting qualified uh, late 1998, 1999. Um, and then what I, my primary experience was in Operation Southern Watch. Again, the history of the war in Iraq, Desert Storm ended in 1991. There were a series of UN resolutions placed upon Iraq that they were to comply with, which, as we know from our history, they did not. And so from 1991 until 2003, when the war in Iraq um, kicked off the second time, um, we enforced no-fly zones over Iraq. Um, Operation Southern Watch was, of course, the southern 
almost half of the country, the 33rd parallel and below. And then Operation Northern Watch was the northern portion of Iraq um, that was enforced out of Turkey. We had missions. I, I never did Northern Watch. I did four Southern Watch deployments. And we basically told them no Iraqi military aircraft can fly in the no-fly zone. Um, and we enforced that through our missions when I was over there. And my first time deploying was in April of 1999 um, over to, that time was called Prince Sultan Air Base. It's in Saudi Arabia. It was out in the middle of the desert. Um, and this was, there had been a bombing, um, Kobar Towers bombing in Riyadh in 1996, I believe. Um, and after that happened, that is when the AWACS had been based up there. They moved us out to this base in the middle of the desert. Um, and so I, my four deployments on AWACS were to Prince Sultan Air Base to support Operation Southern Watch. What was the experience like? Uh, were, you, were you working with the Saudi Air Force or were you working independently with U.S. forces? Or oh, I guess what I'm getting mm -hmm. to, did you have any experience with the indigenous people? With the Saudis, no, honestly. The only Saudis you ever saw would be the customs guy. When okay. you'd arrive, you'd go through customs. Um, that was the last Saudi we worked with. Now the Saudis did have, they have AWACS. They have their, we sold them an AWACS aircraft. They have U.S. fighters. Um, we never worked in conjunction with them. Um, we did work at that time. The British were our coalition allies. Um, were with us over there. So we, we would mission plan and fly combined missions with the British Air Force. Um, they were based at our base. Um, additionally, there were naval aircraft off in the, in the Gulf. We had aircraft in Kuwait and other places that would, would, we would work with on the day. The French Air Force was also on Prince Sultan Air Base. They were not part of Operation Southern Watch anymore. They had been at one point. Um, they just used it as a training base. So we would see them around the facility. We never had any working relationship with any of the French Air Force that were there. When, when you were airborne, mm -hmm. were, who were you reporting to? I mean, I understand that mm -hmm. you were coordinating what was happening in the battle space, mm -hmm. but who were you reporting to? Or who was kind of the overall direct direction right. giver for, for you. Yeah, the way the Air Force is organized here, it's called an Air Operations Center. Uh, the Air Operations Center is our forward, basically, headquarters for a war zone. So there was one at that time that was at Prince Sultan Air Base. Okay. Um, and that was where the general who was in charge of that of that region, the Air Force general, who reported eventually back to Central Command, who, of course, was responsible for all the Middle Eastern operations. Um, that was our direct line of control, if you would. So when we launched um, our missions, we would not actually fly into Iraq with the AWACS. Any of our, we called high-value airborne assets, HV AA aircraft like a, an AWACS or a J-STAR or a Rivet Joint Intelligence Gathering Aircraft, we would stay in northern Saudi Arabia. We'd fly back and forth across the border. Um, the only thing going to Iraq would be our fighter aircraft, aircraft that had offensive and defensive capabilities. So F-15s, F-16s, um, Marine and Navy F-18s, F-14s, um, British aircraft. They would actually go in there. We were there because we, we could see what was going on with the Iraqis. We could see if they were flying north of the no-fly zone line or if they tried to cross over the line. Um, we were there to basically see them because they you, the AWACS radar can see quite a distance um, so we were up there if our radar broke we couldn't fly they would cancel the mission for the day because okay. we were there were ground-based radar units but with line of sight of the earth you can't see um, very clearly a long distance with the ground-based radar unit whereas an AWACS is up at 30,000 feet you can see quite a ways up there and you can't sneak up on any of our friendly aircraft did the AWACS aircraft have, <clears throat> excuse me have any defensive capability or you <laughs> no. just we had nothing I mean our, the, the defensive capability was that you could see um, unclassified 250 miles was unclassified range of the AWACS radar. So you can't sneak up on it. If somebody ever came after us, our defensive theory was be to go low and fast because you can trade, of course, if you're going down, you can trade altitude for airspeed to go faster and head for the Gulf where there were Aegis cruisers and tell them to shoot the guy behind me. That was that was the basic theory that we would do. And we always had F-15s up there. Um, most of the time with us. I will tell an event that happened Labor Day of 2000. Uh, we weren't flying that day. We didn't fly every day for the, the Southern Watch uh, missions. We would fly every every other day or every third day um, when we wanted to have a mission. We didn't, we didn't maintain aircraft continuously over southern Iraq. Um, and on this day we weren't flying, and on, and, but we detected the Iraqis did a, a testing mission to fly against us. Um, they sent one set of aircraft down, if you would, from Iraq around the edge of Kuwait in, in through okay. southern Iraq. Another aircraft came over in the west and came down. Basically, it would have been through our orbit area. And, and they were practicing if they were going to sneak up on us. Um, and so that day, they said, we'll launch up there. And we launched that day. Prior to that day, when we first launched on our missions, there were no fighters airborne in the theater. It would just be the AWACS and our aerial refueling, the KC-135 aircraft, because they want to make sure our radar was going to work before they launched everybody else. Well, if they had done one of these practice attack missions on that morning, just as we got up there, we would have had no one to defend us. From that day forward, 
we didn't take off until two, two F-15s took off ahead of us. And they okay. would go up there and they would be up there before we got there in case that ever happened. Um, because at that time, you know, Saddam Hussein had a bounty on any American aircraft that his forces could shoot down. They never did um, in all those years, um, not for one of trying, because they did try at certain times, uh, but they never succeeded. You mentioned that KC-135s mm -hmm. were up there also. How, on, on a standard mission, how long would you be in the air? Um, it depended on those missions. We would either have a, a one-go or a two-go day. So we would typically, the fighters can't fly quite as long. Right. So they would be up there for about maybe a two-hour block in the area. So on a one-go day, we'd be up there early, check things out. Then all the aircraft would come up. We check them in. They go in. They conduct photo reconnaissance missions, and they'd have defensive aircraft in there with them. Um, then they come out, and if it was a one-go day, then we come home, and it'd be about a six or seven-hour flying day. So um, the C-135s are really for the fighters. Well, we used them as well because if they were on a two-go day, there'd be a set of fighters. They'd okay. all go home, land, refuel, rearm, and then come back up later. Well, we didn't. They didn't want to land us and take us off again. Right. So we'd just stay up there all day, and those would be a 12-hour day. Um, and on those days, we'd have to refuel. Um, typically, the AWACS can fly for about eight hours without refueling. Now, in the summertime in the desert, you can't take off with as much fuel because it's the air it doesn't support you to take off with the full fuel load. We could we would do anywhere from one to two um, to three refuelings on a given day, depending on what time of year it was. And you'd be on the refueling for about 20 minutes or so to get, because we took a lot of fuel on. Obviously, we're a large, yeah. you know, airliner size aircraft, so we'd be on the on the tank for about 20, 25 minutes. Did you eat a lot of box lunches? We did eat a lot of box lunches <laughs> and a lot of snacks. And, it could be some long days. They were interesting, at least, and the, the, those missions were interesting because occasionally the Iraqis would be flying north of the line. Occasionally, they would come over. They they would play games with us. Um, when they, we get toward the end of, they they were tracking us. Obviously, they had ground-based radar. They could see when we were heading out of out of southern Iraq. And the last thing out would be the F-15s or our defensive cap. They'd be circling until everybody else got out. And as those F-15s were leaving, and they were low on fuel because they'd been out there for a while. Some days the Iraqis would then send two fighters down right across the no-fly zone, like, ha-ha, look at us, um, knowing that if we tried to race after them, they'd just fly back above the no-fly zone, and we couldn't get to them anyway, and we were low on fuel. Right. Um, so, But they never tried to fly down there while we were in there with our full force because they knew that that would not succeed. So how long was that tour? When did you leave uh, that the, tour? Yeah, these were, when we say deployments, they were different because we go over very frequently. Those were two-month deployments that okay. we did at that time. So the first one was from late April until June of 1999. I went back again just a couple months later. They had a short notice. They needed someone to fill a crew. Um, so I went back in September, October of 1999 on my second um, deployment, also to Prince Sultan Air Base. And then I went once more in um, the summer of 2000, and then my last time was in um, the spring of 2001. Had you noticed any changes in the different deployments? I mean, any changes in the operating procedures or the, biggest the thing environment? That, the biggest thing that changed is the Iraqis got a little more provocative. I mentioned before that about trying to shoot us down. Um, they would actually shoot surface-to-air missiles off at our aircraft while they were in the no-fly zone. But what they wouldn't do is they would not guide those missiles with their radar because if you know our capabilities, we have aircraft within the inventory that can detect a guidance radar, a tracking radar, and we can send an anti-radiation, we call it, missile down that beam. And so if they ever tried to shoot a surface-air missile, and the way it's supposed to be shot is you shoot it off, and then you guide it in with the radar to track an airplane, um, they would just shoot it off basically blind. They would just go straight up in the air. We would see the detect the launch. We would all just move away from that area. It would go up and blow up, and it, that's why they never, they never shot any airplanes down. They weren't using their equipment the way they were supposed to because I can only imagine they wanted to tell their leadership, we shot at so many airplanes today, not telling them they didn't actually do it the way they're supposed to do it because they wanted to live. Yeah. Um, so that, that went on very frequently, especially in 2000, 2001. Um, and we told them every time you do that, you know, that's a hostile act against us. Um, we wouldn't target necessarily that particular site, but after two or three of those missile launches, we would plan a strike mission. And we would pick a military target in southern Iraq of our choosing, and we and we told them we will we will we will bomb you if you keep doing this. And so, after that time, toward the end of my time doing those missions, we did it seemed like about every week or two weeks we would have a strike mission laid on. Okay. We would go in and we would strike a military target in southern Iraq uh, in response to them launching those surface-to-air missiles at our aircraft. Were were there any instances where uh, the uh, the tactical aircraft, the fighters, mm -hmm. actually engaged Iraqi. Uh... Not any of the times I was there. I'm not okay. familiar with any where that occurred. I mean, there were there were instances where. 
There was one day, the closest we came, there were some Iraqi, we think they were Iraqi military fighters crossing on the top of the no-fly zone. And we had rules of engagement, of course, as you know, or the rules lay down when you're in a combat theater. And in the air world at that time, the rule of engagement was you had to confirm positively it was an Iraqi military aircraft where you could shoot at it. Um, if you weren't sure, you could not shoot at it because we weren't in an active war at that time. It was a, a no-fly zone enforcement. And that particular day, the electronic detecting aircraft that we had up with us was a P-3. The P-3 would not come back and definitively say it was an Iraqi military aircraft and therefore we could not shoot it unless you had a visual identification yeah. of it, which we don't like to get into visual range in the world that we live in with fighter aircraft today. Um, our, the fighters, our fighters were pretty much, they were ready to go get them, uh, but we told them negative, you can't because we haven't identified who they are positively. Um, and we're, those, they, then they eventually flew north of the no-fly zone line. That was the closest we came to actually engaging on one of the missions that I was on. It, it sounds like the, the, once the AWACS was airborne, it was actually a preventive measure to keep the, the Iraqis. Yeah. I mean, they knew we were there. I and mean, the AWACS radar is a very distinctive, very powerful, you can imagine, radar emitting in all directions. So pretty much any, any nation state that has any form of, you know, a military electronics gathering system, and the Iraqis did, can detect as soon as that airborne radar is turned on, they know we're there, which means the fighters are coming right after us. Um, and so, yeah, they knew to stay away when we were airborne like that. So what was next? So I did my four years... Uh, I did four years there on AWACS. Um, I also did a couple of counter drug missions while I was there down to Curacao, which was interesting. Um, and then from there, um, well, I, I, I did want to mention also before I leave AWACS, um, of course, 9 11 happened while okay. I was stationed there. Um, I was on a mission that day, um, and I've got my logbook with me here. Um, this is the, the logbook that I kept as a surveillance officer when I was on AWACS. It's a little cartoon picture of an AWACS there. You can see it's got a little um, binoculars on the rotodome there, which is not actually on the airplane. Um, but on the morning of 9 11, 2001, September 11, 2001, I was scheduled for a, uh, a standard training mission mission, a home, state, home station training mission. And the way that typically would work on those mornings is we went in to get our final step brief with the entire crew, which is about 20 people. This is at Langley? This was at Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma okay. City. Um, we would get our step brief, we'd get on the bus, go to the airplane, we'd stow our gear, make sure our oxygen system worked on our con console, leave the technicians on the aircraft, then we go into base operations to get the weather brief for not only there, but where our operating area was going to be for the day, and then the pilots do their final flight planning before we would take off. As we walked into the base weather office that morning at Tinker, um, on the TV was the second plane hitting the second tower in New York City. Um, that was the one that was on live television because they had been monitoring the first strike. Um, and we knew, I and mean, we were aviators, we understood on a clear day, one airplane, much less two, on a clear day does not fly into a skyscraper in a city. Something was going on. Um, so we, we continued with our planning, of course, if we had no order to, orders to do anything differently. Went out to our aircraft. Um, shortly thereafter, we got orders from um, our base that training was canceled for the day, and within a minute or after that, we were given orders to take off as soon as possible, fly to an orbit 50 miles north of Denver, Colorado, establish an orbit there, and we wait for further, further orders to come. Um, we launched that morning, and it's in my logbook here of September 11th, and I'll provide a copy um, of that day's flight. We launched um, at about 10, 12 central time. And by this point in time, in the day that the history of that day, the airliners had already been landed by that point. So the skies were pretty much clear of, of all the airline traffic. Um, and it's very surreal taking off because typically in the middle of the day, middle, middle of the morning, Oklahoma City is the middle of the country, the air traffic um, radio is just full of traffic. There's nobody on the radio. And typically there's so many airplanes that I can see on my radar, it can overload my processing capability, which is a pretty high number. Um, that day, you know, there were 10 airplanes as far as I could see and nobody on the radio. And we requested direct Denver and they're like, just, you know, don't worry about a flight path, just go direct to Denver. Um, we flew up to Denver, um, which of course is NORAD headquarters is in Colorado. We were providing coverage for that part of the country. There were also AWACS off the East Coast and the West Coast, Washington, D.C. There were multiple AWACS airborne in different parts of the country on those first several days. We weren't sure it was going on. Um, we flew that day for 9.6 hours. I looked at my log there until that evening. Um, we, all we knew we took off was about the two towers hit in New York City. We didn't know about the Pentagon, didn't know about the towers collapsing, didn't know about the Pennsylvania air, airplane the entire day. Uh, we were actually up there chasing down small private aircraft like a Cessna. They're out there, the visual flight rules, VFR, as long as they say they have an airport's range, a stable of certain altitude, they can fly wherever they want to go without talking to anybody. So they didn't know they weren't allowed to fly anymore. So we had F-16s under our control, fighter aircraft. We would vector the F-16s in. You can only imagine they probably came in low and slow right overhead, these guys in a Cessna 
who are then going to turn to what's called GUARD, which is an emergency radio um, that's on both the UHF and VHF radio, and that's where we talked to them on GUARD and told them, you're not allowed to fly anymore. Uh, it was called SCATANA, is the term for what happened that day, which is Security Control of Air Traffic and Navigation Aids. Um, it's been implemented one time in the history of our country, which was for a two-day period from September 11th to September 13th in 2001. And basically what it says is the U.S. military has control of all the airspace in this country. You can't fly unless the military mm. gives you permission to fly. Um, that being said, if I hear, you hear these rumors what happened that day. People couldn't or couldn't fly. Life flights continued to fly that day. The air traffic controllers would call us and tell us they had a life flight, which of course is an airplane with a human organ in most cases that needs to get from one city to another to, for a transplant. They would call us. They would give us what, they were, what signals they were transponding on. We would clear them to fly from point A to point B. Um, so those were flying that day. Other than that, it was basically us. Our aero were fueling the KC-135s. were fueling us and the fighters that we had under our control. That was the only thing flying that day and the next day as well. So we flew, and when our relief plane came up that evening to get us, they were the another AWACS came up to relieve us to assume that station. Um, they told us about the, the the towers collapsing, the Pentagon, and the and I remember thinking at the time that the towers they couldn't have collapsed. They were too big. They, yeah, they were burning. You know, your first thought. So it's interesting when I tell the story to people. It's like. I did this great thing that day. I was over my country, but I, I missed that whole day of our country. People right. sat in front of their television all day and, rec and absorbed these stories. That block of 10, 12 hours, I was not involved in any of that. I didn't watch the news. I didn't see it happen live on TV. It all came to me as a story. And then that night, we came back in and landed, did our debrief. We always have a debrief on TLN, especially this day. Um, all your logs are turned in. They become classified documents at that point. Um, and you debrief what occurred on the mission and they basically said okay come back in 24 hours for mission number two at that point we you know we were flying a lot in a lot of missions there were only about 28 AWACS aircraft in the fleet at Tinker that's all of them now some of those were over and doing Operation Southern Watch Operation Northern Watch um, so we were pretty busy because we were doing what became Operation Noble Eagle was the name of the Homeland Defense Missions. Um, within about a week of this occurring, F-9-11, they named everything in the U.S. Operation Noble Eagle. We were doing Noble Eagle missions. We were doing Southern Watch and Northern Watch. And then when we kicked off in Afghanistan, we were doing Operation During Freedom. Um, we were getting pretty worn down in the sense there's only so many airplanes and so many crews to go around. Uh, they eventually actually, they, they implemented um, the NATO clause. You may have not heard this history of the story, but the AWACS, there's NATO AWACS. And NATO has their own version of the AWACS aircraft. And we implemented the NATO clause that says if one member state of NATO is attacked, then all members will come to the defense. So we actually almost use it in reverse. We use the clause to bring the NATO AWACS to Tinker Air Force Base to have more AWACS platforms to accomplish our missions. So they came there and supported us for several months um, because they just weren't enough airplanes to go around. You, you may have mentioned this, but I, I don't remember. Are all the AWACS at Tinker? The vast majority of the U.S. AWACS are at Tinker. There, we have two squadrons. One's actually at Elmendorf Air Force Base, okay. where I began my career. Okay. Um, there's typically one airplane there, sometimes two in the summer. There's a squadron, um, so just one squadron versus an entire wing. And then at Kadena Air Base in Japan, there's also a squadron, with typically one airplane, sometimes two in the summer when they have more training going on. So, But the vast majority are all out of, we call it Mother Tinker. If you're an air battle manager, you go through Mother Tinker at some point because that's where the pre predominance of our career field goes through for their flying missions. And, so when did you deploy to uh, Afghanistan? Um, that was actually at the end of my time on JSTARS, which we'll, okay. I'll get to you in a little okay, bit. Yeah, it was not during my time while I was at AWACS. So um, we did the 9-11 mission. We flew, after that point, all we flew were missions in support of Noble Eagle. From September, I left there in May of 2002 to go to my next assignment in Korea. So we flew nothing but Noble Eagle defense missions. My longest one was 18.2 hours. It was in September of 2001, later on that month. Um, we were over Washington, D.C. We maintained a 24-hour-a-day orbit with AWACS and fighters over Washington, D.C. from 9-11. I don't know when it stopped. When I left in May of 2002, we were still flying in 24-hour-a-day, which meant it was a 12-hour mission. So every six hours, you took off from Oklahoma City, and AWACS took off. It was three hours to get to Washington, D.C., six hours on station, three hours to get home. Do the math. Every six hours for six plus months, and AWACS took off to go to Washington, D.C. And also, I've got my log here as well. If the president went to um, Texas on Christmas vacation, we flew another orbit over Texas. And when the vice president, I have a couple of these in my log, went to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, Vice President Cheney, we would fly a third orbit 24 hours a day over, over Wyoming to support him. 
Um, and the DC orbit stayed there regardless. It was always there. So um, I don't know if they knew in their holidays how many people were, were having to go fly additional time to, to support them. But we, at that point in time, we wanted to make sure we had something they could see every airplane flying. And yeah. so we would do that. It's, 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 the general public just doesn't appreciate what, <laughs> what goes on. I mean, right. to have a limited resource asset and you, you know. You spread it very thinly. Spread yeah. it very thin, yeah. yeah. So, Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Before we get away from September 11th, yes. what were you thinking that day? And, and did you get reaction from civilian pilots? I mean, in your interactions with them, trying to tell them they needed to get down? Not so much on the 11th. Um, the, the interesting story, the funny story, on the 13th of September, I mentioned I flew a day later. So we came in at basically midnight on the 12th of September over to the 13th was our next sortie. We were also back in that same orbit. We were put back up in the orbit over Colorado. And then during the day on the 13th of September, we're flying. All of a sudden, we start getting contacts all over the scope. There's airplanes taking off. Well, nobody told us that anything was cleared to fly. Um, we were working at that time with what's called the Western Air Defense Sector, which is up in Washington State, the whole western half of the U.S. That is the, the headquarters for our air defense operations. They had no idea what was going on either. And air traffic control in Colorado finally clued us in that that's when they cleared the airliners to reposition their aircraft. If you remember okay. the, the airline companies, because they had landed them all over the country. And they had to get them repositioned to restart their flights. They cleared them when they were cleared to fly, but these small private aircraft were not cleared to fly. Well, the word got out poorly to all these airports, so all these small Cessnas again and similar aircraft are taking off all over Colorado and around surrounding states. So we're out there again chasing these guys down two days later with our F-16s. And the funniest one is, and we were monitoring the radios. You know, we 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 direct the F-16 in, and then we would get on. We monitor the guard radio and. The F-16 pilot, you know, gets this one guy, you know, finds him, and the guy gets on the guard radio, and we're like, you know, sir, you're not cleared to fly. You must return to your airfield. And this was again in Colorado. But it sounded like the guy was from, you know, deep Alabama. He had this deep accent. He's like, I'm just heading on down over here, gonna do. And the, and the F-16 pilot, sir, you're not cleared to fly. And this guy was like arguing with the fighter pilot. And we're thinking to ourselves, this is not the time and day to to be a good old boy and argue where you want to go. And this fighter pilot, the third or fourth call, he's like, you know, sir, you are not, he's getting a little frustrated with this guy, you know. We don't think this guy is obviously a terrorist. We just know he shouldn't be there. So finally, air traffic control says, let me take this one. They hop on there and they say, you know, do you know where this airport is? Oh, yeah, no, well, head on over there because you're not cleared to go where you think you're going. And we got, he's like, okay, and he went on and landed. But it was just, it was the funniest thing. We we're in the middle of the country, but it sounded like the guy had this, this deep accent and was just like this good old boy. He was like, I'm just going to, I'm good. I'm just going to keep heading on. And the fighter, no. And he's like, negative, you know, you're not, you know, cleared to fly. Um, that was the weirdest thing that happened on that day. Um, it was definitely surreal on 9-11, the, the day, the experience itself, um, being airborne with nobody else out there around you and not knowing what was going on that day. I mean, obviously, it was, we were, you know, we were late. And, our, you know, we look back on that, you know, our air defense, we failed that day because we, we were not designed that day to look internal to our country for a threat. NORAD, um, at that point in time, was all looking outward. There was no right. connection between NORAD and air traffic control, the FAA, to connect our radar systems to see what they had. The other thing that the reason that 9-11 happened, you know, is, you know, ATC doesn't track on what we call raw radar. They use transponder codes. An airplane emits a code that says, this is who I am, this is where I'm at, this is my altitude, my speed. Um, that's how they track everything is on those codes. It's easy because it's more accurate than raw radar can be off. Um, AWACS, of course, we use raw radar because the enemy won't squat codes for us, even though we ask them nicely. Um, so we have to track on a raw radar. But when those, air, those airplanes on 9-11 took off, they turned off their transponders. At that point in time, it's a needle in a haystack. You can't find that raw radar dot. Even if they'd been AWACS airborne, we wouldn't be able to find one airplane in the, right. in the, the mess of all the airplanes over the country that day. So. so after that, what? Okay, so I shifted gears. I went to um, South Korea from there um, to Osan Air Base, uh, the 621st Air Control Squadron, which is the, um, the one and only um, air control squadron for all of South Korea for all U.S. military aircraft. It's ground-based assignment, so we're in a place um, called the HTAC, the Hardened Tactical Air Command Center, which was a large reinforced bunkered building, had a big blast door in the front they could close if there ever came to a, a chemical attack or something of that nature. I was there for 16 months, and we controlled um, U.S. Um, military aircraft all over South Korea. We worked closely with the South Koreans there. That's probably my, my closest experience working with foreign nationals. Um, the operations floor, imagine like a NASA setup. It was 60 scopes um, mm -hmm. all around the room and about 90% of those were South Koreans. And we had a little corner 
uh, of U.S. Um, on one side of the room. And then up behind it, there was a raised dais with a glass wall in front, and that was the command scopes. And there were three Korean officers with their three NCOs on the left side, and on the far right was where I sat as the mission crew commander, and my NCO sat there, and we were in charge of the U.S. component up there. Uh, so we worked closely with the Koreans there, um, doing training missions all throughout South Korea and, you know, keeping an eye on the north. What, when you say training missions, what were, what was a typical training mission? I mean, just go up and fly around? Or, yeah, basically or? the same thing we did with AWACS. They would go up, but we had working areas both off the coast on the western coast, and then we had overland working areas in the eastern part of South Korea. And we had fighter aircraft at two Air, Air Force bases. Osan Air Base, where I was at, had an F-16 squadron and an A-10 squadron. And then down at Kunsan Air, Air Base, which was in the southern, more southern part of, of South Korea, had two squadrons of F-16. So we had four squadrons of U.S. aircraft in theater. And other aircraft would come over there sometimes for training, and they would fly up and we would control them. Um, our controllers on scope would, just like the AWACS would do, um, they would be 2v2 or 4v4, and they would do, you know, pretend attacks and we would control okay. them in um, doing those missions and we tried to maintain the peace with our Koreans. Um, it was their airspace obviously we used it. Um, sometimes our our fighter pilots got the attitude that it was the Wild West because they there was no FAA, there was no US FAA, US FAA there. So they couldn't be violated, if you would. A pilot, if you break FAA rules, can you violate, you can get your pilot license revoked, whether you're military or civilian. Their theory was, well, nobody could do anything to them over there. They did whatever they wanted to. But the problem was when they would, they would want to take an airspace that wasn't theirs. Oh, we'll hang out until the Koreans get here. It was Korean. They were going to do Korean training. They had Korean fighters, obviously, working all over the country as well. And we said, negative, you know, you can't be in there. Koreans don't want you in there. They would try to go in there anyway. And then when it's time to leave, they wouldn't leave. And the Koreans would get very upset. They would take away airspace then from us. And we'd have to, we'd have to smooth this over within our right. building because we, right. we actually did that within our facility there. Um, so that was the hard, the most frustrating part was this, this attitude that, you know, the, the, the fighter pilot mentality at that point was do whatever we want over here. And it, it was passed down as each people would come into the country. They, oh, you can do whatever you want over here. Don't worry about it. Um, and occasionally we'd have situations where they would do things that were totally unacceptable. And we, had to, we, we actually had to order them to go home. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't do that, but there was a level above me at the Air Operations Center. I could call another officer and explain this fighter pilot is about to make the Koreans very upset. He's not, he's not following what we're telling him to do. Can I send him home? And they would say yes. And that would be my favorite call. <laughs> they told the SOTO, the Senior Operations uh, Duty Officer, and said, SOTO directs RTB. Because I couldn't direct it, but the SOTO yeah, right, could. He was yeah. the representative of the, of the general, if you would, on the operations floor. Were there ever any situation, did any ever, ever situations arise where you had North Koreans uh, playing games, if you will, or coming down? And, no, and, they didn't. I mean, the, that, there was such a volatile area there. They didn't do things like that in the air. Now, they, while I was over there, as you know, throughout history, there have been provocative acts by North Korea. While I was there, they sank a South Korean fishing vessel, which for a while raised the stakes for everybody over there, and things were kind of, t t the height, tensions were heightened for a while over that. Um, there was never anything that happened in the aerial environment while I was there. Um, we tended to stay away from their border. They stayed away from the coming over in our border, so that was never really an issue. Our biggest concern there was we knew that if the North Koreans ever did come over and decided to you know, launch a, a major invasion, we were one of the first targets they were going to strike in right. South Korea because we were not only with the U.S., this is also the South Korean Air Defense Headquarters as well, um, that they would attempt to take out our building, uh, our radars, our radio. So we knew that, you know, we the way we, we saw it, you know, we were, to put it bluntly, we were the American blood. You know, the small number of American Army and Air Force personnel in South Korea, and they are to today, that if, if North Korea ever comes south, we're the promise that the rest of the military is going to come over and avenge us because yeah. we're not going to probably last very long over there with what little bit we have on the ground um, and the initial strikes. Um, but, you know, we were there in case we could, you know, do whatever we could to, in those first few hours or days of the war until more forces could come to us. Were so. you still a bachelor? I was at that time, yeah, I was okay. still a bachelor. It was a remote assignment, uh, but I was a bachelor <laughs> at the time, which was which it worked out nicely. Um, so I was there for 16 months. I got extended twice, um, thanks to the personnel system. It was supposed to be a 12-month <laughs> assignment. Um, I wanted to getting extended twice, because while I was there, this was 2002 to 2003. So I was in Korea when we went into Iraq in the invasion okay. in, in the spring of 2003. We were in Korea. A lot of our younger officers were like, they were kind of disappointed because they wanted to be over there on the AWACS. Because a lot of these, most of us were coming from AWACS. Um, they wanted to be over there back on AWACS, you know, fighting the war. And we had to explain to them that everybody can't go fight the war. It's everything situational. You'll get your turn later. Uh, right now, we got to keep our eyes open for what North Korea might do because we weren't sure how they might respond at that time. When we're distracted in some other part of the world, we can't be distracted everywhere. So that's what our job was to keep that that line. 
So where did you go after Korea? So I left there in October of 2003 and went to my second operational aircraft. I came to Georgia. I was down at Robbins Air Force Base in Warner Robbins, Georgia on the E-8 J-STARS aircraft. Um, and J-STARS aircraft is basically, it's the same airframe as an AWACS. It's a Boeing 707 airframe, uh, except instead of having the rotodome on top, it's got a radar on the bottom. We call it the canoe. There's a fiberglass covering over a radar. It's a, a radar on the bottom of the aircraft that shoots off the side of the aircraft. Um, and it is a ground tracking radar. So we track vehicles on the ground. Um, and the, the J and J star stands for joint because it's a joint Army Air Force aircraft. Um, most of the crew is Air Force, but we always had one Army officer and two Army NCOs on every combat crew um, that supported our connections with the Army forces on the ground and the Marines that we supported. So what, what were your missions like uh, with that unit? Um, I went through my training again. Again, just like AWACS, every airplane has its own training pipeline. So I was in training for most of 2004, um, and I got done um, late that year. And my first deployment on J-STARS was in May of 2005, and that was over now. At this point in time, after 2003, a little bit of history of the region. Once we defeated Iraq in 2003, the Saudis said, thanks for your support of the kingdom, you can leave now. And they basically asked us to leave the kingdom of Saudi Arabia with all of our U.S. military personnel. So Prince Sultan Air Base was closed down or given back to the Saudis. Um, and we went to a base called al Udeid Air Base, which is in the country of Qatar, also called Qatar, but it's actually pronounced Qatar, um, which is off the eastern side of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. And that was now our new air base. Um, that was where the Air Operations Center was, and also the predominance of our aircraft Air Force aircraft um, in theater were based out of LUD, and that's where I did my four deployments over the next couple of years were out of um, LUD Air Base on the J-STARS aircraft. Um, the first deployment we did, we, we basically, we had this beautiful radar aircraft, and we were basically used as a radio relay platform. Um, at that time, um, it, you may or may not understand, we can't fly every, all our supplies into Baghdad. Right. Um, you can only fly in so many supplies, even with contracted flight and U.S. cargo, Air Force cargo aircraft. Most of the supplies came in overland. Um, from Kuwait, they came in from ships, came through Kuwait, and they were driven up in vehicle convoys um, to Baghdad and then points north and west of there. And it was what was called Main Supply Route Tampa, MSR Tampa was that road. And it, this was when things were really unstable, if you know what happened in this time. This is when the insurgents were really on the rise, a lot of imp improvised explosive devices, IEDs going off. And these convoys at times on that road were not within radio range of any other ground sites. So our purpose was basically to be there as a radio support platform. So if, if they had a vehicle breakdown or an IED strike, um, we, they could call us, we're at 35,000 feet, they could reach us very easily, direct line of sight. We would call what's called the sheriff stations, which were the, the, the points are on the ground that were there to support those convoy operations. And they could come in with security assistance, um, tow truck, or we could do medevac with helicopters as well. We had a, a, a very quick procedure. They had helicopters on the pads, just like in Vietnam, same, situ same, same type scenario on the pad, ready to go. As soon as we got called that someone was injured on any of these convoys out in the middle of nowhere, um, we would call down, again, our Army guys were doing a lot of this for us off the airplane. We would call the medevac center, and before we even stopped talking, they would have the rotors going on those, on those helicopters, and we would give them all the information of where exactly this injured person was so they could fly in, land, and get them to the, as quickly as they could to medical care. So that was the big part we did my first year that I was there. We were basically tied in southeastern part of Iraq. We had to stay within radio range of that, that okay. supply route. Um, my second deployment, and, and our deployment cycle was a pretty much a regular cycle. This is a little from my AWACS days. There were three squadrons at that time in, of J-STARS. They were all at Warner Robins. It's the only base in the world that has the eight J-STARS aircraft. So every squadron would have a three-month deployment to the Middle East and six months at home. That was your cycle. That's how you lived your life. You'd spend three months in the desert. You come home. You get a couple weeks of R&R &R time. You go back into what your normal home assignment was, doing your job at the squadron. And then about a month before you left again, you start spinning up, and you go back for three more months. So I did that cycle three times in a row. Um, so my second rotation was in early um, 2006 in the spring. At that point in time, they'd found other radio aircraft, some C-130s, other things that could do the radio relay mission, which then freed us up to use our radar, which is what we're really there for, to be command and control on a radar aircraft. So we moved around the country at that point. We supported missions in northern Iraq. We did border, we watched the borders between um, Iraq and Iran, between Syria and Iraq. Um, we'd support the British. The British were in southeastern Iraq and Basra. We would support the British um, down there with um, oversight. 
and we just watch for anything moving around in the local ground commander. They could put in requests for us to watch a certain piece of ground, and we could see any vehicles moving in that area. And we could send that directly down to the Army. We had a, a, the, the JSTAR system has Humvees on the ground with systems designed to take our direct radar feed, and they could actually see what was driving around their area real time while we were flying above them. So was it, it had to be a vehicle? I mean, what, could you use this for personnel? No, it's basically a vehicle. It okay. had to be big enough. Yeah, right. I mean, I've, I've heard stories about trying to put tinfoil on somebody's head, have them run around and see if they could pick him up, and um, that did not work, I don't think. I don't know if that's true or not. That's the rumor you hear. Um, yeah, basically, it had, to, it, had to be, it had to be big enough to be, you know, metal. It's radar. You have to reflect off of something, and he had to be moving. Um, we also had a, what was called a synthetic aperture um, radar. We could take a picture. We take a radar okay. picture. Um, it looks like a very fuzzy picture of the ground. Um, you couldn't see things. You can like pick out people or individual cars with that, but you can see things like hangars, aircraft, bridges. You could do like post attack reconnaissance for bridges block, no, okay. block, blown out or not. You could see it was no longer there. It basically, shoots a. It's hard to describe. It's like a really fuzzy picture. The radar is actually shooting into the ground and drawing a picture on the ground. It's like a, a black, a grayscale picture, if you would, of what's okay. actually on the ground. Uh, didn't use that very much for combat. We used to, to take a picture of your house sometimes. <laughs> you get to shoot it off the airplane. There's my house and a <laughs> radar picture. But usually we use the actual radar, the raw radar feed, trying to track those vehicles. Was there a lot of activity? Um, we we. We stayed pretty busy. Um, the way it worked is, like I mentioned before, the local ground commanders would ask for us to shoot everywhere. Now, as opposed to an AWACS radar, which shoots out continuously in all directions, the JSTARS radar, it's got to process a lot harder. It's processing out the ground clutter, right? right? So we had to, we couldn't shoot every piece of ground all the way around us. We had to have little blocks of ground that were picked out. And that was went through the intelligence platform. The local ground commanders would go through their chain of command. They would say what they wanted us to look at. It would get back to the operations center. They would then rack and stack how much time we had. And it was all about what's called radar return time. So you can imagine with a vehicle on the ground, if you're looking every two minutes, well, two minutes a car can turn a lot of times. You can't tell where that car is anymore. So we wanted to have a radar return time in a matter of seconds so you could actually see what a vehicle was doing. So we would shoot different pieces of ground for whatever our mission. It would change during the course of the mission. And it was interesting, too, because the radar was designed for a Cold War environment. So it was designed, the theory being the battlefield is here. We're going to fly our airplane along the southern part of the battlefield. The radar is going to point in one direction. At the end of the orbit, we're going to turn around. The radar then actually can do this. It flips side to side in that and shoot off the other side. Well, when we were shooting all over the country, because these orbits, we'd have pieces of ground either side of us, the radar would be constantly turning like this. And then if you're up in the front of the airplane, which is where the crew rest area was, you'd take your meals and take a break, the, 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 you'd actually hear it pounding into the bottom of the aircraft, back and forth every few seconds, going from one side all the way to the other. Um, and supposedly the engineer said it was okay, it was designed to handle that strain, but it wasn't built to do that. It was built to basically fly down one line and look in one direction, turn around, flip to the other side, look in the other direction. We were looking constantly in all directions because that's what the mission was at that time. There was no battlefield. The whole country was the battlefield. Right. Um, so how long would one of those missions last? Those were about the same as, we're about eight, nine hour missions for the most part. Um, we were flying two to three airplanes every night. We flew at night. We rarely flew during the day. So we would launch um, right after sunset with the first one and we'd stagger the other one. We'd, and like one airplane would be in south, southeastern Iraq supporting the Brits. One would be maybe over the Baghdad area. One would be out in the western desert keeping an eye on the border with Syria. Um, so I call it the, the vampire lifestyle. So when you, I go on these deployments, and these were three-month deployments, as I mentioned, you would pretty much be, you would sleep all day and you'd be up all night, every day. Even the days off, that's what you did. That was your, that's what your schedule, your body clock was set to. So it was, you'd wake up at sunset every day and you'd go to bed at sunrise, and you did that for three months. It was an interesting way to live your life. When uh, aboard the bases, mm -hmm. um, did you have contact with any of the Afghanis? Were you ever concerned about your security while you were on in, the ground? Cutter, no. We, I mean, in Cutter was a was a pretty safe area. There weren't there okay. weren't any um, terrorist attacks going on there. Um, you know, the, probably the, the the biggest threat I ever heard of was back to my time in the Prince Sultan Air Base. That at one point they supposedly found a couple of. Um, shoulder-mounted um, surfaced air missiles off the end of one of the runways that had been uh, tried to be fired at us. That's when you're only, that's when you're at risk. Your risk is when you're first taking off and when okay. you're landing, because when you're at high altitude, at that point in time, there's nothing that the Iraqis had they could shoot you down with, because, you know, we, they're all their big fixed SAM sites were gone. We'd taken over the country. A, a shoulder launched, a small, we call man pad, um, is only good to, you know, a few thousand feet. 
Um, obviously on takeoff, when you're in a big heavy, heavy airplane like ours, that's when you worry about something like that. Someone being outside of the base, right. out in the desert, who's going to target you. So we would try to take off. We would actually take off. You'd stay as close to the airfield as you could and try to climb an altitude. The fighters, they, they would actually take off and do this, which is really cool, because they could do that. They would take off, say, right over the airfield and climb several tens of thousands of feet straight up so they wouldn't have to worry about going out and someone possibly trying to strike them. We couldn't do that. Our planes wouldn't do that. When when you were not flying, did you have the opportunity to engage with the uh, Qataris? Qataris? Um, not so much. On the base, just like in Saudi, I mean, you saw the customs guy. That was the last um, Qatari you saw. Now, we did have these, these folks more so at Al-UD than I saw at Prince Sultan. They were called third country nationals. <clears throat> these were people that were hired to work in the mess hall, okay. clean the facilities, um, worked at the barber shop, you know, all these places. Um, and they were people from Malaysia, Indonesia, India that had, you know, no job prospects in their home country. They were brought there under contract with the Qatari government to come work on our bases. Um, and they were called TCN. So they weren't, they weren't okay. U.S. or Ally Coalition. They weren't Qataris. They were other workers. And, I mean, they, they, they were really... It was, really sad conditions. I mean, there was a group that cleaned bathrooms. That's all they did. Twelve hour, For 12 hours, they would go from one giant bathroom facility, because we had trailerized facilities with separate bathrooms, and they would clean bathrooms all day. Um, that was their job. And you think, you know, how sad that was, but they probably made a lot more money doing that than they could in their home right. country. So they were sending money back home. But this reminds you, you know, that, you know, the not that America is a greater country than any other country, it's just the opportunity we have living in our country. It makes you grateful for what you've got by the pure luck of being born here. Um, there's a lot of places in the world they don't have that opportunity. There was no chance for these men to get a, go to college, have a, a provide for their family in their home countries. So they had yeah. to come over to the Middle East, and all the Middle Eastern countries do this. You know, Saudi, Kuwait, um, they don't typically do the manual labor in their countries. They hire all these other folks to come in from other parts of the world to do that. Did you ever get a sense of what the local folks felt about the situation, about the presence of uh, U.S. forces? I think they were mostly friendly. The only time we ever were around Qatar is we were able to go down to Doha, which is the capital of, of Qatar, of Qatar. Um, we, would, we could sign up to go down there like for a day to go to the mall and, and okay. go wander around the city. So I did that three or four times on my deployments while I was there. Um, never really interacted with other than you know, the folks at the shops. You would go buy stuff from right. folks and the merchants. Some of them were Qatari. Some of them were from other countries. Um, but Qatar was an in interesting country because they, they weren't like Saudi. You know, Saudi Arabia is very, um, the women wear the full robes. And, and if you would go downtown there, they had to, our women had to wear the full robes in Saudi Arabia. And Qatar, as long as everybody wore long sleeve pants and long sleeve shirt, um, then that would, men and women could just wear regular civilian clothing. And there were people in Qatar that were, um, you know, Western, westernized members of the nation that women and men wore regular clothing. And then there were also, you see women at the mall that had the full hibaj on, hiba, I think is the name, of, with the whole, all you see was their eyes, you know. Um, so there was both sides of that there, um, but never had any incidents or anything like that downtown. Again, we didn't really interact with the local nationals um, much at all. I mean, I'm running well, the base. Was, was it different in Saudi Arabia, or would you say it was the same I never the went downtown in Saudi Arabia. Okay. In Saudi Arabia at that time, they went back and forth on restrictions, and most of the times when I was there, they would restrict us where we weren't allowed to go downtown. Okay. If there was risk of, because there was much more of a, a terrorism threat in Saudi Arabia than there was in, in, in Qatar. Um, okay. So Saudi sometimes, I never was able to go off base in Saudi. Okay, so you're at Warner Robins. Mm -hmm. You're coming to the end of your career at this Getting time? towards the end of my career. I was a major at this point in time. Um, I was um, met my wife at this point in time. Um, she was working up in um, Clayton County in Morrow at the State Archives. Uh, met her through a mutual, uh, my old teacher, mutual friend of ours. Um, we began dating um, at the beginning of my second deployment. And then we got engaged right before my third deployment, uh, which was at the end of 2006, 2007. We had we had the the great holiday deployment every because the cycle would stay the same. So you had one you left right before Halloween. So at the end of October, you came back in early February. So you missed Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. My wife's birthday was in January. So you missed all those um, holidays. Um, but interesting story on that time. We flew on Christmas Eve over Iraq. One of my missions was Christmas Eve to Christmas Day. Um, it was just a standard mission. We didn't get Christmas off because those missions we had every day we were flying. Um, and so we got on our comm guys. We had them reach out and find a radio relay platform, an island somewhere out there, a military site on the ground using HF radio, which HF is very long range radio. It's also very staticky and very finicky, um, but it goes a long way, especially at night. And we got an HF radio and we got a hold of this ground station and they did phone patches for the entire crew, five minutes to somebody back in the States on Christmas Eve 
from the skies over Iraq. Uh, so there were about, again, about 20 of us on the crew. So we went through the entire crew. And I went last because I was the mission crew commander other than the pilot. He got to go to. I let him go ahead of me. Um, and I was the last one and we lost the signal. Uh, oh. So I would have called my fiance if I had had the chance or my folks, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but I was the last. But again, you're a commander, you go last. Right. Everybody else got to call someone for five minutes and guess where I'm at, you know? <laughs> I'm over Iraq right now. And we got to watch the sunrise, you know, on Christmas Day over Iraq. That was in 2006. And um, that was an interesting experience there. And then my final deployment was in 2008. Um, in January, February, it was a two month deployment. They shortened them from three to two months at that time. Um, and I um, pinned down Lieutenant Colonel um, in 2007. And my last assignment, um, I got away from the operational world. I went into ROTC command. Okay. Um, I went to um, the San Francisco Bay Area. I was the ROTC commander at um, the University of California at Berkeley. Ooh. Yes, I usually get that look from most, especially military <laughs> folks, and I say, yeah, I was in the military in Berkeley. My son was born in Berkeley. That's, his, that's going to be his life story. Why were you there? My dad was in the military, of course. That makes no sense. Um, so I was there for four years. I was the detachment commander and the professor of aerospace studies um, at California at Berkeley, um, which was a great place to live. Uh, if you've ever been to the Bay Area, it's a wonderful place to live out there. We enjoyed it. My son's first three and a half years were out there. Um, tough recruiting environment. Um, the university was very supportive of us. So people that think that the University of California, it is a very liberal university, uh, but they were supportive of our ROTC units. We had both Army, Navy, and Air Force. We were all in one building together. Um, some people in the city of Berkeley were not as supportive of us. Um, they still thought it was 1967. Um, I, I had a, you know, a few times I had people say things to my face um, in uniform because I would walk, because my, my office on the edge of campus, I'd walk to get lunch every day in my flight suit. Um, a few times people would say stuff to you. The one that sticks out in my mind is I had a fellow commander who was from San Jose State, which is in Silicon Valley, so about an hour and a half south of Berkeley. He was the ROC commander down there, and we would periodically get together to, to discuss things when we were peers. He came up to visit me one day at Berkeley, and he would always kind of rag me about, oh, you're up there in Berkeley and liberal this and liberal that. He joked with me about all that. So we walked to lunch that day. We were both in our flight suits. We were both actually air battle managers. He was also an air battle manager, which is a weird coincidence that we both got through the same year within you know, an hour and a half of each other to the same type of job. And we're walking down the streets of Berkeley, and not a student, but some you know, older citizen of Berkeley, as he walks by us, always says in this not particularly nasty way, but he says, you are not the answer which if you've seen the bumper stickers for the peace movement, war is not the answer. That was what, he, and I'm thinking of all days, I mean, it happened maybe four or five times in four years that someone would say something negative to my face. And this was the one day when, when Rick Moxley, my buddy Mox, had to be with me. And I'm like, oh, all days, this is the day that a citizen of Berkeley has to make some very liberal, very anti-military comment to our face when he's walking next to me. So I never heard the end of that. I can imagine. <laughs> So when, when did you leave the Air Force? Um, I retired in 2012. Okay. Um, so I did four years of command at Berkeley. I actually got extended. It was a three-year assignment. They extended me for one year so I could reach my 20 years of eligibility. Um, I decided my son was, I mentioned, three and a half at this point in time. If I had stayed in, I would have probably gone back to Warner Robins. Mm -hmm. I would have got requalified in the jet quickly, and I would have been in the desert just as many times as they could send me to the desert. Um, and I would have missed months and months of my son's life growing up. So I made the decision at 20 years and six months of active duty, eligibility to that was obviously eligible for retirement to uh, to hang it up on my own terms um, versus of course at this time there also were a lot of early retirement boards going on the drawdown right. that is continuing to today was beginning at this time and once you're passed over twice for full colonel which I would have been that fall I was passed over in the zone in 2011 I would have been passed over in 2012 most likely I would have been met a board and possibly been you know you're forced out in a matter of, of yeah. a few months and, and this was on my own timeline so um, yeah. so I retired. is the rarefied air. Yes, so I didn't. I didn't quite get there. I mean, I I had a good early career, but I didn't get. I didn't go in residence to schools. And that was the first, you know, kind right. of right. check mark. I did all my correspondence courses, Air War College, Air Command and Staff. I didn't go in residence to school, um, and so that's kind of that first, you know, identifier, if you would, this year that that tight line to get to to full colonel. Um, and plus ROTC, it was a tough place to be because you're surrounded by a lot of superstars. Um, there's a lot of lieutenant colonels, and they're all coming out of that one senior raider, if you would. Um, yeah. So you had a lot of competition for those um, definitely promote recommendations coming out of the ROTC, the major command for the whole country. Um, so it was pretty rare for guys to, to get So there. what was life like after the Air Force? Um, it was interesting. We retired out of California. We came back to Georgia. Uh, my wife actually is an, a native of Athens, Georgia. Her father was a professor for about 20 years at the University of Georgia, so she grew up in Athens. Um, so we decided to come home for family. 
Um, at that time, my parents lived in Kennesaw, um, but they've since moved to Athens as well. So they, they live in Athens now as well. Um, so it was an interesting experience. I, was, I kind of lucked into a job, if you would. I had no job prospect. Um, a lot of my buddies that got out of the service, they would stay near a military base and go to work for one of the military contractors, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, um, you name it. Um, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to get out of that world, if you would, and go closer to family. So we went to Athens. Um, within about three months, I found a position. I got a job um, in the Cooperative Extension Service. I worked for the State 4-H office for three years um, doing a program called Operation Military Kids, which was a national program that provided support to military children that ran under the control of each state's 4-H office. Um, so I kind of got, I got the job because I had military experience. Otherwise, I had trouble getting my foot in the door. Mm -hmm. A lot of university positions, they want someone to come there that has prior experience in that specific university job. I didn't have that, obviously. I had different experience. Even my time at Cal Berkeley didn't really qualify. Um, but having the military connection got my foot in the door. Um, and it was a great experience. I worked with military families all over the state of Georgia, and as you know, Georgia's got um, all four right. branches of military bases. We've got a huge National Guard and Reserve population, so I worked all over the state doing camps, doing year-round youth um, councils and programs with military kids. Uh, it was a great experience being part of 4-H. And uh, It sounds like fun. It sounds like a great it was a great experience. second career. It kept yeah. me connected as a military army brat and you know, having lived the life these kids lived, I'd been where they'd been, not in the same type of world because I didn't live with the Iraq, Afghanistan, dad or mom, as it, life is at risk for a year at a time um, scenario during my time frame growing up. Um, but I lived that life and then I'd been in, on the active duty. So I did that for about three years and then I just recently moved to a new position. The Operation Military Kids stopped being funded um, by the department. It was funded by the Department of Defense. They stopped funding the program um, in 2015 and so I moved over now I'm at the Georgia Center which if you know the University of Georgia is the conference center slash hotel slash banqueting center for okay. the university literally across the street my office is across one street from my old office um, now I work a program called Summer Academy which is a set of academic summer camps for um, any kids not military kids so I basically got into the university with my military connection and I've moved to a new position based on my time working with youth programs so this is it worked out perfectly I'm in a great job now I highly yeah, enjoy it sounds and, great um, yes. um, as we're closing out here does anybody have any questions Sue or Carl did you would you any comments okay, okay. Uh, the last thing we do is to ask the veteran it's kind of like your opportunity to editorialize mm -hmm. any year final comments about anything? I mean, it was a great experience. I tell folks, you know, I, my son, is, he's seven now. I would love it if he wanted to go into the military, but he's not going to have the same worldview. Obviously, I watched my father put on the uniform every day until the time I graduated high school, and that's the reason I went in the military was his example. Um, just picked a different service. Um, but my son is all going to be stories for him because he doesn't even remember California at all. He has no memories of Friends, things we did out there. He has no memories of my time when I put the uniform on every day. So it's just stories to him. We just mm -hmm. we just told him the 9/11 story just this past week. Our pastor mentioned it in church last week about 9/11, and Eli asked, "What does that mean?" And we never talked. We don't talk about those concepts with him yet. And so we talked about my, my wife's like, you, "Do you know where your dad was that day?" And it's like he was flying over the country. Um, so. Um, I would love if he wanted to do that, but I think it was a great experience. My, my military career was very unique in the sense the first half was pre-9-11, almost 10 years, and the second half was post-9-11, which is an entirely different world um, for all the services and the Air Force. Even though we were doing the no-fly zones, it was, it was not a war combat type scenario. After 9-11, the whole world changed as far as our focus, where the threats were, um, the, the reaction of people to you. Um, you know, I, I mentioned in Berkeley, had people say negative things to me. They also said positive things to me on the streets of Berkeley. People would stop and shake my hand and say, thank you for your service. Uh, more so in Warner Robins in Oklahoma City, but it happened in Berkeley as well. You know, that, that, that gratitude for the military, you know. And, um, you know, I, I think it was, it was a, again, a great experience. I, I think anyone would do well to be in the service. Um, I know a lot of people that kind of gave them their, their, their hope in life, you know, especially the enlisted side. They had no other option in life. And my dad, you know, he'll, he'll tell his story later today, was, you know, drafted in the Army. And that opened up an experience for him that gave me the life that I have, a chance to go right to college from high school, um, a chance to, you know, to live a life where you didn't worry about, you know, food or rent or the, the roof over your head. Uh, we didn't have that. And the, the military gave us that life, you know. So, and they obviously still pay my pension. They pay his pension today. So, you know, I'm very grateful for that. And I do miss it a little bit. You know, there's times 
times when you, you know, especially when you, I'd visit a base in my previous mm -hmm. job in Operation Military Kids, I go to a lot of the installations around Georgia, and you know you see everybody, especially Warner Robins, my old my old stomping grounds, and you see people in uniform there, and and you, you kind of miss that camaraderie a little bit. Um, but it's been nice. The, the 4-H, I took 4-H was very much like the military. So it was that same sense that people aren't making a lot of money. It's a bigger purpose. In that case, it's about working with youth. Um, the statewide network kind of doing that. So it's a very similar environment. So it's a nice nice transition to go into that world where there's the same kind of mentality of serving a larger purpose, which I think is what the military is, is still all about. You know, it's something larger than yourself. It's about, you know, serving your nation, protecting your nation. And, and everybody I knew that I served with, you know, almost to the last person was there. It wasn't about money for college. It wasn't about, you know, life experiences and traveling. That was always part of it for some people, but it was always about giving something back to your country. And that's what I think, that's why I loved it so much, was being part of that experience. Well, thank you for your service, and thank you very much for uh, doing the interview. It's probably one of the most enlightening interviews that I've uh, participated in, and it was very enjoyable. So again, Great. thank you for your time, and, and once more, thank you for your service. All right, thank you. Brian, that